Now to finish off, I can put my confidence to the test. Let's take four aspects of IT which are no part of my job and let's have me comment on them from my perspective as an insider. Okay, so there are four things that I think are overrated and of no personal interest, of limited personal interest to me. The first is AI, artificial intelligence. You know, without emotion, there's no such thing as intelligence. These computers, they have no ability to act with any degree of intelligence because they have nothing remotely like emotion and will not ever have anything like that any more than a rock will. So uh, when people talk about artificial intelligence, what they really machine, what the, when people talk about artif artificial intelligence, what they really mean is machine learning. And when they talk about machine learning, what they really mean is machine recording, because that's all the machine is doing. All it's doing is recording. And then somebody has written code which uses that data by making certain assumptions about it. So there's no, there's nothing going on that is remotely similar to what life does. You know, the small, the tiniest, tiniest amoeba-like living organism has the ability to replicate. It has the ability to recover. It has the ability to um, live and die. It has, it has purpose. And a computer, what happens the moment anything goes wrong? You switch off a computer and you switch it on again so that it starts from a known state. That's the first thing you do when anything goes wrong. No computer has the ability to preserve its experience <clears throat> from one switch on to the next. And we have no way, computer programmers have no way to create a record of experience that would in any way be similar to what life does. It's, 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 it's a big thick black line between organic life and inorganic non-life. So in 1,000, 10,000, 1 million, 10 million years AD, we will not have computers that are sentient. We will not have anything that is sentient. The most we will have is a mouse that's hooked up to a computer that somehow has been trained to do very, very simple tasks which then drive the computer. You know, that would be how you would actually uh, create uh, um, create autonomous intelligence. That would actually be how you would do it. That would be the only way to do it, some version of that. And I mean, that's no less acceptable than what we're already doing with mice, which is we're, we're using them biologically because we can't use humans. You can't, you can't hook a human up to a computer and get them to be, be its, and get the computer to live through the, the, the human. That's never going to be remotely desirable or possible. The closest you can get is to take a much more simple form of life, which 
which it would not be inhumane to do that with and do it and that's that's what's going to happen that's the way that's the way things are going to go metadata code is data metadata is not a thing just because the word exists doesn't mean it means anything Yes, there could be such a thing as metadata, but you'd have to have some definition, some dividing line between data and metadata. Otherwise, metadata is just data. So metadata is not... Uh, Metadata is not of interest. Object oriented software. I'm what's called a functional programmer in the sense that my software, uh, my software has, <coughs> consists of functions which call other functions. There's no hidden data there's no data that's locked away it's all open i think that we've already said with our code data interface and our three dimensions we've already said what is the fundamental paradigm for understanding IT and I don't think objects and design patterns are they are um, they are an alternative way for a team to work but they are not the only way a team can work a team can work with functional programming if it wants to if that's where the interest lies if there are advantages. The the idea that with with object oriented programming and design patterns you can be more agile is I think unwelcome. I don't think I don't think those things make large companies more agile. I think what is needed is not agility. What is needed is tactility. You need to be hands-on with your software and you need to make sure that you don't make your decisions in advance of when they need to be made. The later you can make a decision, the more information you have, the more likely it is to be right, to be the right decision for, for the circumstance. And that I would, I would describe as tactile development rather than agile development. And I think tactile development is something that can be done by large or small without any caveat. Tactile development is soft development, like tailoring. You know, if you, if you cut a piece of material that is designed to have a seam going along it, and you cut too much away, then that seam isn't going to go through the material, it's going to miss the material. And that's not going to work as you're tailoring. Your tailoring is going to come apart. That's really this with 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 the mutability of software. The brittleness is the fact that it comes apart too easily, like bad tailoring. It's not because it's hard and needs to be harder. Lastly. 
are silos the way to manage software in the world? Should we have these silos of um, responsibility? You know, if you if you do front end web development, you know all about JavaScript, you know all about HTML5, you know all about Bootstrap, you know all about the stack, you know all about Apache, you know all about Ruby on Rails. These are silos of separation and you have to wonder whether that's the right way to address the mutability. You have to wonder whether it wouldn't be better to make everything a toolkit, make nothing, make everything an implementation of a toolkit, but make everything expose its interface. Rather than, rather than writing its interface in stone and saying forevermore thou shalt do it through this. The great success of Alan Cooper's work on Visual Basic was to recognise the separateness of the interface from the code and the data. And that's still the most successful paradigm object oriented and patterns and best practice they don't they don't they aren't as good as that let alone better if i don't like the interface of javascript or ruby on rails or apache i ought to be able to rewrite it I certainly don't like the, the interface of LibreOffice and I certainly think that should be rewritable and I think it should be rewritable in the way that Office was before 2007. Just saying. So now let's talk about three dimensions in programming. I want to talk about it in two contexts. The first is the Microsoft Office context and the second is actual coding itself. So for coding itself, we have three elements of what we call software. We have code, which can be, as you appreciate, in any language, although typically written in English. We have data, which is what the code, <coughs> <coughs> we have data, which is anything from a date stamp to a name, an account balance, Generally, data is in types, integer, floating point, and so on. And the third, the third element of the, the third element of code is the interface. So what do you see while the code is running, but not, not just that, but also what does one piece of code see from another piece of code while the code is running? <clears throat> you can see code and data and interface 
as being orthogonal to each other in the same way as three dimensions of space or three dimensions of mind are orthogonal to each other. And the thing to bear in mind would be because they because there are those three elements, two of the elements are exactly equivalent to each other. So code and data, to take that example, pair, a pairing, as an, to take that pairing as an example, code and data, there is no distinction between them. Code is a form of data because you write it down, it's a, it's a, it, it appears as a flat listing just like any other data and you can act on it as if it was data. There's no reason, there's nothing stopping you doing that. Similarly, data is what code re re data is what code requires to work so code assumes that there is data and it it makes other assumptions about that data code equals data interface code and data are orthogonal three dimensions also has a direct application in another area and that's the area of office software so microsoft word microsoft excel microsoft access are implementations of general purpose programs in those three areas a, a word processor a spreadsheet and a database that may or may not use SQL. Now the interesting thing about those is the data that they assume and the data that they assume is one dimension, two dimensions and more than two dimensions. Three? Hang on. As we'll see. So a word processor works on a document which is essentially a one-dimensional list and that is how it understands the data that you give it and it's also how it understands the job it needs to do. A spreadsheet <coughs> works on a table, it's two-dimensional data and that is how it understands the data it receives, it's also how it understands the job it's trying to do. Microsoft Access, for example, is a relational database. You specify the relations between the elements. Effectively, it doesn't know what the third dimension is. You tell it. You tell it what what the dimension of a table is by specifying the key and the indexing. I don't want to get, I don't want to get, uh, I don't want to get technically exact because there's no need for it. What is worth bearing in mind is that once you know that, you, there's no need for uh, an IT person who knows that to be afraid of those software packages. It's perfectly possible to approach them with no information and learn in steps and gradually build up effectively a full picture of everything those programs can do and if you've got a good enough memory how they do it. I was uh, highly motivated to, in the, in the period after 2000, when I was switching over from my algorithmic, it was C language that I was using mostly, and Unix, to a more visually adept approach, uh, a, more a more visually sophisticated 
development environment. I was highly motivated to, to, to do that with Microsoft Office. And in fact, one of the things I, I did do was to start to redesign the user interface. The, the menu elements of those programs is fairly arbitrarily chosen. And so what you can do when you've when what you can do when you apply the thinking I've just outlined is you can say, well, I could redesign those in, I could redesign that aspect of the of the I could redesign that aspect of the interface to reflect the internal operation of the program and then it would become more accessible. So instead of having file, edit, view, I can't remember what the other menu options are, but instead of having those, I could have document as being one thing, and then page as being one thing, and then paragraph, and then word. The, it would be possible to redesign the interface to make it much more accessible and it would be possible to do the same in Excel and it would be on a completely different basis. So Excel doesn't have documents, it has tables. So you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have document, you'd have table and then you'd have cell as a, as a menu option. And it would be much more accessible. So what I, what I was able to do in this period was to implement that in a program and I called it an office, I called it a, a, a demonstration program and the most successful element of it was in <clears throat> so I did that with Word and with Excel, but I didn't do it so much with Access, partly because I didn't know Access at the time, but more because even when I did come to know Access, I did appreciate that there was no, uh, um, there was nothing to be gained by doing that with Access, because Access is not fundamentally a Access is not fundamentally something that is, is, is uh, there is a barrier to understanding how it works for a novice. That is not the problem with access. To some extent, you have to, you have to, you have to want to know, you have to want, you have to want, you have to want to use access you have to need a database enough to make you happy to learn by doing and the uh, the things that access users appreciate from other access, other access users is how to do things nobody really needs a better way to understand access nobody needs a way to make access easier for a novice user that's n there's no appeal for that so that's why it it was appropriate for for the two for the one dimension and two dimension but not the more than two dimensions so just quickly going back over over Just quickly going back over the um, over the periods of my career, 
I would say that um, what 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 gives me such satisfaction and such confidence about my current work is I spend uh, I have the ability to not just write the code, not just design the data in the SQL Server database, not just write the code in the Access database's language, but I also have the, the, the uh, ability and the freedom and the desire to design the interface because that's what Access is, is there to allow you to do. And that aspect of design is highly, uh, 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 highly rewarding. I've come to it from a from a, a visual background because the actual code developer that I used for the voice recognition software that I worked on professionally in Unix was literally a visual designer. You didn't write code, you identified blocks that perform functions and you arranged them in a flowchart and the program implemented the flowchart. It was an amazing an, an, an amazing thing to see in reality to be able to to be able to design completely visually and step through and debug completely visually was uh, uh, was um, in in some ways a dream come true to somebody from a text based language background. But it was invaluable to me to have spent the previous 20 years, two decades, learning the craft of writing algorithmic software, largely textually. In many ways, the power of software, as opposed to the power of mathematics, comes from the use of text for everything because when everything is described textually then the names of things becomes extremely important to aid understanding and so by naming something correctly you aid understanding for all the time that, that software is in use indefinitely from then on and by renaming something you you change its function it, it's 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 mutable in that way if by using the ability to rename you can change something into something very like it but not quite identical to it and it's this mutable element of software, which is both what gives it its brittleness and also what means that what, 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 what has the other outcome of making the <clears throat> understanding of a complicated program partial. In other words, when you look at a when you look at a program, you can understand part of it completely, or you can understand bits of it. When you look at a, when you look at a complicated program. You can either understand part of it completely, or you can understand the whole of it, 
partially. You have to appreciate that because if you think you, are, you understand it and you change it, but you don't understand it, you'll break it. This mutability is also an inherent fragility. There's a softness in software engineering that is more important than the engine in software engineering. So if you don't appreciate the importance of names and how they've got to match up with each other and the significance of renaming, then what will happen is they won't match up with each other and you get a discontinuity. And that's, that's what I mean by brittle. You get a discontinuity and then it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work how it should work. And you don't know why, because you don't know where the discontinuity is. It isn't a matter either of wishing you had a complete understanding. That isn't it, it. That's a misunderstanding of the problem. The fact that you have a partial understanding is not necessarily a disadvantage. The point is, you need to understand what you need to understand at the time to do what you need to do. So by avoiding having to have a complete understanding, you can make your job more interesting, be no less capable at it, and actually create something that is <coughs> aesthetically pleasing, elegant is the term. It's a bit like tailoring a, a wardrobe a, a, a set of clothes. You don't tailor the whole wardrobe in one go there and then and then fine fine tailor it. You tailor an individual outfit and then you put that to one side and you tailor another individual outfit and you do that until you've done all the outfits that need doing and then you look back on it and if it's not visually appealing, you say to yourself, well, I need, I'm, you say to yourself, well, I'm not as good a tailor as other tailors are because they are able to do this. You don't say to yourself, I'm not as clever as other, as other tailors are. You say, I don't know my craft as well as other tailors do. And I think that's where my confidence comes from as, as I, as I reach the end of, 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 a, of a long path, I think it comes from the fact that I don't particularly feel I know more. I don't particularly feel I know more than other people. I do know I know as much as other people because I do the IT support reasonably well. But what I do feel is other people don't know more than me. I, I have a level of capability which makes me their peer. Welcome to the sixth and last video of these series where I return to my roots and talk a little bit about my career in IT. How do three dimensions, a theory of three dimensions, how does that manifest itself in IT? Well, you might be surprised 
that it very much does. So it's been a big help to me having the philosophical outlook that I've had in my, in my working life. I'm about to approach my 60th decade, my decade of 60s. I'll ask you to accept my um, <clears throat> I'll ask you to let me get away with saying that as I as I approach 60, I find myself surprisingly perhaps at the top of my game and in a surprisingly comfortable position as regards the work that I do. I'd like to talk a little bit about how I got there, which is the reason for saying it. Let's, uh, let's take a quick look back uh, over the decades and see see how uh, see see uh, what the different phases were so in my 50s i finally managed to move from rented accommodation into a flat of my own so i made a transition from being permanently um, going where the work was to actually having a base and obviously there was a that that was a life changing um, development because it, it it just gave me a much greater quality of life having my own place. I also uh, settled on the <coughs> technologies that I use in my work the <coughs> my, my my choice of favorite technologies which are the access database development software that's part of Microsoft Office the SQL Server database, which is um, not part of Microsoft Office, but is available free of charge. And in combination with software development, IT support, so people contact. So I'm not, um, not, not writing software eight hours a day, I've got some variety. Um, so in my 50s, I really set upon that as being better than what I've been doing previously. Welcome to this, the sixth and final hour-long video in this series wherein I return to my roots as an IT as an IT as an as a whereby I return to my roots in IT. Let's have a quick look at what, what we're going to cover in this hour. Okay, does the idea of have of three dimensions have any relevance at all to my work in IT? It certainly does, as we'll see, and that's what the whole hour is really the purpose of it. Are there people I want to draw our attention to working in the field of IT? Role models, gurus, there certainly are, four of them. What is a very quick snapshot of my career? Well, as I, as I approach my 60th birthday, I'm approaching a new decade, my 60s, I find myself surprisingly at the top of my game in terms of my, in terms of how comfortable I am with the work and how much I like the work I do and how uh, I feel about the working environment. So I'll ask you to take that on at face value for the moment. We'll I, I appreciate that doesn't necessarily go without saying. Um, that's after a, that, so that's at the end of what has largely been, I'm pleased to say, an upward slope. So if we look back very quickly, in my 50s, I acquired a flat. So a life-changing 
difference between renting and having to go where the work was to being able to a buy a flat and b say i am now going to have a base and i was able to do that because i was very very comfortable with the combination of access database development a standard part of the microsoft office suite so ubiquitous uh, sql server back end so high powered technology and support it support so i enjoy i enjoy the side of helping people i enjoy the side of uh, getting my hands dirty with uh, with um, low level problems and that was a, a good combination in my 40s 30s and 20s i was um, largely an, <coughs> largely a software engineer not a support person and I was largely writing algorithmic programs rather than um, visually designed programs, which you do with Access. So uh, in my 40s, I was um, a Perl programmer, but also very interested in, in visual design and using a, an actual visual design compiler. In my 30s, I first got in involved on, uh, vo in voice recognition software and that was running on, largely on Unix at the time rather than Microsoft. So my experience and background had been in Unix, not in Microsoft. And that had started off in my 20s when I'd worked for a defence company. I'd not had an IT software degree, so I'd learned on the job. I'd been put on an assembler course and I'd really taken to it and um, done a day release course and uh, got, a, got a basic training in software languages. Quick look at that, so a quick, uh, a, a quick look at my career and then after I've applied the latest thinking to my, where I've ended up, then we'll be in a position where I can talk about the value I've had from not my work, but my uh, natural affinity with IT. So uh, I've been doing a section I love in each hour long episode, and this is no different. I'll be talking about um, the software I love, which is consumer software in the sense that it's Bryce, it's Coral, it's the things that I've I've uh, bought and enjoyed but run on a PC, word processor software, that sort of thing. Okay, so that's a snapshot of the hour long episode today. Let's contrast my career since uh, starting in the business at the age of at the age of 18, 19, 20, with a history of IT from an outsider's point of view or from an insider's point of view. Again, going in reverse. Actually, no, better this time going forward. So I started in 1980. That's when I was 20. And that was pre the existence of the personal computer. There were personal computers there just wasn't a standard, there wasn't the IBM PC came along in about 1984. Prior to that, personal computers were a, were, a, were a novelty and they were not what mainstream programmers worked on. So my, my introduction to computers was mini computers uh, rather than mainframes. In 1990, I was 30 and it was pre the internet. So whilst the PC had become well established enough for uh, people like me to buy them and get interested in software from that point of view, uh, there wasn't a, it, it was before Windows 95 even, so there wasn't a, a strong um, general interest in IT. In 2000, well, that was before Facebook, YouTube, streaming, etc. And in fact, 
1997 to 2007 was in some ways the golden age of the PC because that was the, that was the time when you could go out with £100 in your pocket and you could buy a sound card, you could buy a, a, a scanner, you could buy a colour printer and you were right at the cutting edge of, of, of <coughs> right at the cutting edge of people who owned these things. So you could um, you could buy a magazine like Computer Shopper or something similar, and you could be part of this community of people who were discovering and discovering and discovering. And from 1997 to 2007, Microsoft and the Microsoft Office suite really did colonise the world of computing. It, it, it colonised both business and home with, with software and it led the way and you, one mustn't underestimate the achievement of establishing uh, such worldwide success. It was truly a phenomenon. However, the excitement of the, uh, uh, of the period 1997 to 2007 was this tremendous excitement of being part of understanding and learning the world of the PC. And I would say that that is what gave me a... That is what gave me the experience of becoming a producer rather than a consumer. Uh, Marx said that uh, workers should take over the means of production. Well, unfortunately, Marx has been somewhat left behind by history because in that period, we were actually just given the means of production. If you've, got a, if you've got a colour printer, if you've got a scanner, if you've got a sound card, if you've got a, 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 a video camera, you can produce things. Why doesn't that have, why doesn't that create a Marxist re, re, why doesn't that create a Marxist revolution? Because you haven't got the means of distribution. And in actual fact, that's always been the problem with Marx. So, according to Marx, you pick up a guitar, well, I've got the means of production because I can play a guitar anywhere. I can play it in a bar, I can play it overseas, I can play it in, in a town centre, anywhere. I mean, it is the means of production. But until computers came along, you couldn't cut a CD yourself. Now you could. The problem is, you couldn't distribute it. I won't get sucked into a very interesting conversation. I'll just leave it at that. So, um, so it, so, from 1997 to 2007, the golden age. In 2007, it all ended. However,
and two. In 2007, it all ended when Microsoft brought out Office 2007, which was no longer backward compatible with earlier versions of Office because they completely changed the toolbar. Why do I say, why do I say up until 2007? In 2007, Microsoft Office came out as 2007 and there have been many versions since 2010, 2013, 2016. Why do I, why do I draw a line at 2007? Well, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that. Again, let's take it at face value just for the moment. So in 2010, as a producer, I'm going to start to want to um, do more than just produce. So I'm In 2010, I was 50 and I'd started to lose interest in the biggest thing. I'd started to lose interest in something that was actually at the time becoming bigger than the film industry. I'm talking about computer games. I'd played, I'd played the, uh, I played, I played the blockbuster games that came out at the very beginning, uh, Doom, Quake, Tomb Raider, Age of Empires, so on and so forth. I played them and I wasn't that interested in them because I had always been more interested in where the computer contributed to the to the game strategy, um, quite honestly, I was more interested in Free Cell than I was in uh, Call of Duty. Uh, Free Cell, the computer had the ability to remember every deal and recall it. Each each Free Cell is a game of solitaire. Each each individual de- de- each particular deal of the solitaire had a number associated with it so you could play the solitaire uh, up to a point and then come back with using the number and play it again and again and again well that's you can't do that with a with a deck of cards so it enabled you to ask a question that you could never answer yourself with a deck of cards, which is, can I, uh, if I play, if I play a certain percentage of games, will I win? Because if I play a percentage of, if I, if I play a certain percentage of games and win them all, I then know that that game, I then have a reasonable 
basis for thinking that game, you would win every game if you played it. So I'm really playing, let's say, 400 of these of these individual deals to the point where I'm certain that I can do it or I, or I, or, or I get beaten because in principle I'm playing all the games. Now that's kind of my cup of tea. So I had a lot of fun with free sell but I did lose interest in, in other games. Uh, I was more impressed by the graphics rendering software that I had free of charge I was more impressed when I saw that working because I thought well you know that is that is doing the work that a programmer that it takes the computer minutes to render that scene and I know how much I know how much work the computer needs to be doing for it to take minutes to do it as a computer programmer so I was very very impressed by by the rendering software less less i was much less interested in the mechanisms of, of games which which was good for me because the graphic software i was using was free of charge thanks to thanks to the programmer who wrote it who had an idealistic idea of giving it away for free so eric eric wenger W-E-N-G-E-R, I owe a personal debt to, of gratitude, for giving me, literally, hours of creative enjoyment, a grown-up version of a game. The other people I mentioned, my heroes in IT, the other people, along with Eric Wenger, uh, Ted Codd, an English programmer who worked at IBM and developed the SQL programming language there, well I use that every day and the power of that language, the power it gives me to do my job is uh, unforgettable and uh, again I would, I would owe Ted Codd uh, at least as much of a debt as guys at Microsoft. Ted Codd, Eric Wenger, Larry Wall and Alan Cooper. Larry Wall was the creator of Pearl and Pearl was the stepping stone for me from visual languages to the visual basic development environment and it was Alan Cooper who originally created the visual part of visual basic Bryce and Coral Draw. How I would describe Bryce is as a photo quality version of Minecraft. Having never played Minecraft, it's what I imagine it can do, um, which is that you can build things, build anything that you're anything that you can imagine. And I feel the same way about Bryce in uh, <coughs> What it what it offer, what it what it it appears to offer magic in that it appears it, it gives the impression that you could build anything that you could imagine and take a photo quality picture of it. This was a lot more amazing um, when I came across Bryce in uh, the eighties. Because 
films hadn't broken that ground that is now well trodden of making the impossible commonplace and as believable as the ordinary. When I first saw Bryce uh, ren uh, create a render, okay, what Bryce actually is, is a 3D ray tracing program, which means what it does is to calculate the paths of rays of light. That's how it creates a photograph, by actually representing what goes on in the physical world in terms of light. When I first saw Bryce uh, calculating a render, I was blown away simply because watching the computer become 100% busy for minutes at a time as a result of what I'd done, I knew how much programming was needed to use up the computer's resources in that way. So I was kind of blown away by it as a, as a programmer. And indeed, my whole entry into it was uh, from having a programmer's mindset about it. So the user interface was interesting. The fact that you couldn't, uh, the fact that you had um, an indefinite range of units uh, in terms of the mathematical interface to it. All of that was fascinating and a way in. Now, there isn't time for me to go into much depth, so I've got to keep it brief. So I'll just bullet point the things that have held my interest over the time, uh, over the decades since I first came across Bryce. And it's one of those things that you think, well, when I retire, you know, I'll have all the time I want to, to spend on it. But it's uh, rather more challenging than that because with Bryce, you have to have an end goal in mind already. It's a bit like setting out with a blank piece of paper and a pencil. You have to know what it is you want to draw because the choice would otherwise be overwhelming. Now, uh, I talked about the user interface, and one of the interesting things about Bryce is that the user interface is created by the program itself. Um, so the, the pictorial elements of the user interface are not the usual uh, button and um, uh, menu dialogues, although they are present. Um, it's uh, it's a, um, the tools are represented visually by objects that you would recognise as, as having been made in Bryce. What it struck me that you could also do is to build studios. So uh, in the same way that Word, say, comes with templates, it struck me that you could make templates for Bryce, which would be the equivalent of studios. You could have an indoor studio with lights arranged to, to, to focus on a focal point, and you could have an outdoor studio with uh, sky, landscape, trees, mountains arranged in a, in, a, in a way that was unique to your setup. And then you could uh, explore rendering within those contexts and that would be a natural way to make uh, to make the, the program more accessible to the novice user. Bryce also does animation. So one of the things that I got used to seeing was I got used to seeing book covers that I <coughs> particularly as it happens, IT books. I got used to recognising book covers, book adverts, other IT product adverts, which looked as if they'd been created in Bryce because they had, because they had that, that look of things that you can do very easily in Bryce. Create a steel ball and map the reflections off it. So, I mean, 
this was a program that had, you know, a cultural impact on my world. When I, when I opened up the program for the first time, I immediately started to ask questions about it. So for instance, you have a globe which can have different materials, steel, uh, reflective steel, plastic, um, wood, um, and these are virtual materials. Glass is one of the materials. You also have uh, light sources, circular, square, um, point light sources. So immediately it occurred to me, well, can you put a light inside a globe and see what that looks like? And the reason why I thought that was interesting was because in the real world, you'd have to create a light that used a battery and then enclose and then build the, the glass sphere around it. Otherwise, the only way to do it is to have a trailing wire. And that had never been done, I'd never, or, or at least I'd never seen that. So I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, I can see what that looks like in my render. And um, because the glass sphere is sort of mathematically perfect, you've got that pleasing element of seeing something that's real that cannot possibly exist. And it's the same thing that used to appeal to me about comics. So hence, I was very, very pleased um, to, to have this program to play with. The first things I sort of started thinking about doing were all to do with light um, in terms of you know, putting things inside things and seeing what the reflections w that, 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 that it made were. Uh, things, things hover in Bryce, they're not subject to gravity. So positioning things is, is very, is quick to do um, if, if, it's a, if it's a simple setup, if it's a simple scene. So you can get results quite quickly. Um, you've also got landscape generation so you can create um, a, a a ground surface a sea surface a, a horizon a um, mountain you can do these things very easily uh, and very quickly you don't necessarily get good results very quickly and very easily and that's where the that's where the real challenge comes in but you can get a result very quickly and one which to the novice user has a, a, a deep appeal. The other thing to mention uh, <coughs> about Bryce's animation, of course, is that if you start to do um, informational videos or, re or even if you do advertising videos um, you can make use of the of the animation uh, capabilities of Bryce to to help you uh, create these things without having to, I mean it, it, without having to spend any money because Bryce has always been an extremely low cost product in fact, it was free initially, originally, um, and y you can get results within a reasonable time frame. One of the things I always thought was that I'd like to, I'd like to get a group of us together and be, you know, a group of like-minded people who are interested in Bryce and create uh, shared resources for us to use. But in some ways, that would, that might have been a distraction. Um, because it would have taken away some of the difficulty and therefore some of the solutions that, that have come my way as a result of, 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 of playing. That's Bryce in a nutshell uh, and um, it's uh, and, and what I say about it is still relevant 
it's certainly to me today, and I think to the product today, which is that although uh, there's no, um, because Bryce is a low cost product, it's also, a, it's unfortunately also a low investment product. And it's been quite a while since there was a, a, a new functionality included in Bryce. Um, and there's certainly no plans at the moment to introduce a new version. So there is an element of um, history. There's an element of what's the phrase for old software. There's an element of legacy about Bryce these days. But until something comes along that think that combines power and simplicity in at least as good a way as Bryce does, then Bryce stays certainly uh, as somebody who already knows a fair bit about it, not as much as I could. Um, it remains my first tool of choice. Uh, I want to mention Coral as well, Coral Draw. Um, got some pictures here of things that I did in Bryce early on. So I've got a plant inside a steel ball. I've got a wooden ball inside um, a metal cage. I've got uh, a wooden ball with an alpha channel, which means that it's rendered transparently. I've got a still life with my making use of my ball with a light inside. I'm hoping I've got landscapes. they might not be in this folder because they were kind of easy to so cheap and easy to do I don't think I've put them in my in, in my top folder what I have what I have got is a an example of where I've really benefited from from being able to uh, do what, I, what what the heck I want. So I've got a sea with an island with an unfeasibly large uh, peak and on top of the peak I've put a construct of infinity and I replaced the what it's standing on, which I wasn't particularly keen on here, by filming my, by taking a photograph of myself and then putting the photograph in. So that's a, that's a very powerful technique in Bryce, the fact that you can import 2D, 2D images and render them within the scene. But this file came around, this portfolio, for want of a better phrase, um, came about because uh, when I came across Coral, I had the opportunity to... Um, take advantage of the graphical uh, learning I'd gained from looking at all those comics. So uh, loving comic art and seeking it out uh, had given me a, a, a strong taste for visual, for visual, um, for what was visually appealing. And so I was able to put that to use. First of all, um, fairly simply, I just <coughs> Coral Coral comes with a lot of fonts, 
at the time a number of those graphics programs came with a lot of fonts and so the first thing I did was to come was to go through and create a bunch of font pairings so that, that I found pleasing that I thought I could refer back to if I needed to and I still like this because uh, it's it, it's still got that 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 visual appeal of oh yes those really do work together and do create interest um, fonts have come a long way since since I first got coral and so one of my favorites is our uh, well the, these are the names of the fonts but my one of my favorite aspects of fonts is the dirty or ugly look as I think of it if your message is urgent intriguingly it's often effective to portray that message in a dirty unfinished way to give it urgency whereas uh, obviously the natural um, the natural thing is to create it as, is, is to just make it as pretty as possible and <clears throat> that's not always appropriate so with with coral draw When I first started working on my writing, I, I, which did include, which did need to include, the sorts of. Uh, let's find an example. When I first started doing my writing, I did need to do diagrams just like this, and I was drawing them by hand. Now, one of the one of the advantages of drawing by hand is that you can make them logically exact, and that's a great power in a diagram because what it's doing is it's reflecting back to you in a non-verbal way what is what is often initially a verbal understanding. So it's a feedback. Now, with Coral Draw, I was able to preserve that diagrammatic accuracy, that logical exactness, but also to create quickly, relatively quickly, uh, relatively easily and very satisfyingly these beautiful renditions. And that was a huge, huge benefit to me in continuing to do the work year after year uh, and and re and come back and redo it to, to make it finished. Here's an example of the combination of um, being able to make my own choices. So I've got a choice of font uh, 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 and, a, and a pairing of fonts, which is my choice. I've got a, an illustration, which is rather what I wanted, a nice abstract illustration that, 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 uh, catch, that I think was a good reflection of the, of the uh, size of the subject. And that's a, Bryce, um, that's, a, that's a Bryce created image. And of course, that's uh, the, the, the diagrams, as all the rest of the diagrams in the book, are all done um, originally in Coral Draw and then put into Excel as being the best way to manage the presentation and then finally into Word where you can do your, your, your book creation. All of which was, uh, you know, 
immensely rewarding and great fun for me to, to be able to do. In learning how to use the program, I'd played a lot with uh, obviously things, you know, the things we all play with. I'd, I'd done my own business cards, I'd done my own stationery, I'd been able to do a certain amount of marketing uh, materials for myself. I had um, I had even benefited from the fact that you can uh, I'd, I'd even benefited from the fact that coral draw comes with clip art. Clip art is, uh, is, is rather old hat these days with with Google image search. But in actual fact, it is quite useful having a restricted set of images that you can use to uh, convey your message non-verbally and that are royalty free and that you can, because you've got the original, you can manipulate to convert into something uh, that is unique and personal to, to your message. And the other thing that Coral Draw comes with, which was rather rather fortuitous is it actually came with a 3D application when the uh, in the version that I had and 3D application had the ability to render fonts in 3D so what I was able to do was to export words from that 3D application and import them into Bryce and again that made um, that made what I could do for myself um, very, very much more powerful than it would have been um, if I'd have uh, had to find a model for for every situation. So the combination of Bryce and Coral was really um, all I needed and all I could manage in terms of my spare time. Um, I would have liked to have become an expert in Photoshop and uh, Coral Photo Paint, but uh, that 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 wasn't where I, that wasn't the road I went down. Uh, uh, and I can't regret that. Uh, the combination of work, the combination of Microsoft Office with the, the combination of Microsoft Office for documents and object linking and the drawing tools and the rendering uh, was really and the animation has really um, made me um, it's given me the means of production and through the internet I can't really claim I haven't had the means of the means of distribution so it, it is a it is an indication of how much fun I've been having that I haven't uh, done things before now. It is an indication of how much fun I've been having that I haven't gone public, as it were, with things before now. <laughs> 